At the beginning of the Christian movement, Jesus' followers were fed to wild animals for Roman entertainment. Then, as the story goes, the Roman Emperor Constantine had a vision of the cross, which inspired him to adopt Jesus as his savior. As a result, the West became Christian. But did Constantine really convert to Christianity? Or are modern Christians worshiping a version of Jesus created by a die-hard pagan? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovic. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Simka has come to Turkey, to the city of Istanbul. Back in the fourth century AD, Constantine built his new capital here and called it Constantinople. By that point, Constantine had already legalized Christianity. But it's still a matter of controversy whether Constantine himself became a true Christian. I'm underneath modern Istanbul, the city that Constantine built. Until Constantine, some 300 years after the crucifixion, Christianity was essentially an illegal movement. After Constantine, within a few years, a few decades, it would become the official religion of the Roman Empire and the reason why so much of the world today is Christian. The question is, who was he? And the religion that he created, is it a religion that Jesus would recognize? In the fourth century AD, the Roman Empire was divided into four major areas. Each region had its own ruler. But when Constantine's father, who ruled the West, died in York, England in the year 306, his army declared Constantine ruler of the entire Roman Empire. This sparked a bloody struggle to determine who would end up emperor. In the year 312, Constantine was pitted against the general Maxentius, who controlled the central region, including the city of Rome. Their famous struggle for power was depicted 1,200 years later in these frescoes by Renaissance artist Raphael. Based on early Christian sources, Raphael painted these narratives on the Vatican walls. And it's these frescoes that tell us the traditional story of how Constantine converted to Christianity. But there's a much older work of art that tells a different tale. It's called the Arch of Constantine. And Constantine himself had it built here, in the center of Rome, to celebrate his victory over Maxentius. Over six stories high, Constantine's arch was erected just 91 meters from the Colosseum, where Christians were once killed for sport. For fear of damage, the Department of Antiquities in Rome hasn't given anyone permission to examine it up close for more than 30 years, until now. The closest you can get to Constantine is the arch behind me across from the Colosseum. It's Constantine's victory arch, and on it he sculpted his narrative. The problem is you can't get close to it. In 30 years, no one has. But now, we're gonna go up and take a look. In his quest to decode the arch, Simka is joined by Constantine expert Elizabeth Marlowe, who has seen the carvings on Constantine's arch only from ground level or in photographs. Until now, she has never seen them up close. Oh my God, look at that. That is so fantastic. Look how big they are. From this elevated perspective, Simka can now see how Constantine wanted his victory over Maxentius depicted in stone for all time. This is amazing. I'm excited. It's like spectacular a to be up here. Everyone should see Constantine's arch this way. Constantine's arch depicts the battle between Constantine and Maxentius for strategic control of the Milvian Bridge, just north of Rome. According to the tradition depicted in Raphael's paintings, Constantine's forces were greatly outnumbered. But then, Constantine is said to have had a vision of the cross, 
followed by a dream of Jesus that changed his life and ours forever. In that moment, Constantine was said to have denounced the Roman paganism that he was brought up with in favor of a newfound belief in Christianity. He ordered his soldiers to paint their shields and banners with the symbol of the cross and led his army to victory. He then went on to convert the entire Roman world to the Christian faith. That's what the Christian tradition tells us. But what does Constantine's arch have to say? In this panel, Constantine's face was deliberately hacked out by a long forgotten opponent to his legacy. Here, we can still clearly see the defeated Maxentius drowning in the river Tiber. But is there any evidence that Constantine really had a vision of the cross that converted him to Christianity? Who's that guy behind him? That's one of his own men carrying a standard. That's a military standard. No cross there. No cross there. You can't see that from down below. No. I see a shield very clearly. Yes. No cross there. No, no. When we look at the evidence from Constantine's reign itself, the Arch of Constantine really being the best source we have in the years immediately following that battle, there's no trace of Christianity on this monument. No images of Jesus, no crosses, no Christian symbolism anywhere on his arch. Considering his vision, you would think Constantine would be championing Christianity. Is it possible that there was no vision at all? In Constantine's day, emperors had to win over the Roman army. Was the vision invented to win over Christian soldiers? But wait a minute, the Roman army persecuted Christians. It crucified Jesus. There wouldn't have been Christians in the Roman army. Maybe there were. To investigate the possibility of Christians in Constantine's army, Simca travels to Northern England, once the outer reaches of the Roman Empire. It's here where Constantine's rise to power began. The area is littered with Roman military forts, like this one, located at Hadrian's Wall on the Scottish border. And it's here that Andrew Burley has found evidence of Christians in the Roman army. Now, what do you make of it? Well, this is not a random thing. This is a very purposeful thing. Now, corresponding with the cross inside the, the room in this building here, on the section of the wall next door, there are seven crosses like this one inserted into the wall, all in one section of wall. To have seven so close together is very unusual. Third century Christian symbols carved into stone but the same Roman army that crucified Jesus. Evidence that Christians were fighting in Constantine's army even before Constantine came to power. Winning them over would have been of paramount importance. But were Christian soldiers also serving in his rival Maxentius's army? There'd be much more likely to be Christians in, in Maxentius' army than in Constantine. And Constantine's army was largely composed of people from, from the far barbarian north where Christianity had made very much less impact. So it seems Christians were well entrenched in the Roman military before either Constantine or Maxentius fought their famous battle for the Milvian Bridge. But if Maxentius also led Christians into his army, then what's so unique about Constantine's claim to be a Christian sympathizer? To learn more, Simca needs to find out what Maxentius really stood for. The only personal relics from Maxentius' reign were recently unearthed here, just meters from Constantine's arch, by archaeologist Clementina Panella. Panella believes that these royal scepters, spears, and weapons belong to Maxentius himself and were venerated by his faithful followers, just as Christians venerate the cross. Ritrovato il corpo di Massenzio, Costantino taglia la testa di Massenzio e la porta in città. E Costantino, ovviamente, avendo vinto col sangue, deve dare del nemico la peggiore presentazione. Quindi Massenzio è il tiranno, i panegirici dicono le cose più terribili di questo Massenzio, i vizi più turpi gli sono attribuiti, 
e la memoria di, di Masenzio viene, come al solito, cancellata. Upon his victory, Constantine tried to wipe Maxentius from history's good books by portraying him as a pagan tyrant and a Christian persecutor. Però Massenzio invece è stato un grande imperatore e Massenzio non diede fastidio ai cristiani. E io mi chiedo che cosa sarebbe successo eh, se Costantino non avesse vinto. Che cosa sarebbe successo della nostra civiltà che poi è piena di cristianesimo e noi siamo dei discendenti di questa, ma di questa battaglia. So if the image we have of Maxentius as an evil pagan tyrant has been fabricated, is it possible that the image we have of Constantine as a Christian emperor has also been fabricated? To answer that question, Simca now investigates a secret religion that claimed the most powerful people in the empire as its followers. This religion worshipped a pagan god who had an uncanny resemblance to Jesus. Early Christian history states that the Roman Emperor Constantine received a divine vision of Jesus before defeating his arch-rival Maxentius, winning control of the Roman Empire and causing the Western world to become Christian. But was Constantine a true Christian? The most important statement we have from him is his triumphal arch in Rome. On it, Simca doesn't find a single Christian icon, but he does find pagan symbols. On this panel, Constantine is surrounded by pagan gods, the god of the river Tiber, a winged goddess of victory, and by Roma, goddess of Rome, an archaeological patchwork of pagan symbolism compelling evidence that Constantine only adopted Christian ideas to gain favor with Roman soldiers in both his and Maxentius's armies. But winning over common soldiers wasn't enough. To gain control over the entire Roman Empire, Constantine needed the support of the officer corps and the Roman elite. Many members of these classes belonged to a mysterious cult that had been around since before Jesus. The cult was called Mithraism named after a Mediterranean sun god called Mithras. How did Constantine mobilize both these religions to serve his own ends? Can it be that what appealed to him was a blend of Mithraism and Christianity? Did he fuse the two together to create a super religion that would allow him to gain control over the entire Roman world? Not far from the Roman military fort where Simca has seen evidence of Christian soldiers in Constantine's army. Another fort was discovered in 1949 by a French bulldog sniffing for bones. But instead of bones or Christian symbols, this fort revealed a special temple built by Roman officers that were devoted to the pagan god, Mithras. My father's dog, same breed as this one, a uh, French bulldog was sniffing around and found the middle altar. As you can see, it's very wet here. It was all preserved due to the dampness. Now, this is close to the Roman fort? Yes, and it was 500 foot soldiers, and Mithras was for the officers. So that's why it's so small. So the Roman officer class, which Constantine belonged to, secretly worshipped Mithras at this temple. At the exact same time, an increasing number of ordinary Roman soldiers were worshiping Jesus right next door. Mithraism was an elitist and secret religion practiced only by men. Initiates walked into this clandestine temple lit only by a few torches. Arriving at the front of the temple, these initiates would have seen an altar to the god Mithras, rays projecting from his head Lit from behind by candlelight, the halo effect symbolized Mithras' status as a sun god, a striking precursor to the halo that surrounds the head of Jesus. This could be mere coincidence if it weren't for the fact that archaeologists 
have found the remains of Mithraic temples all over the Roman Empire. And more often than not, those temples were found hidden beneath the world's first Christian churches. To see one of these Mithraeums, Simca now goes to the Santa Prisca Church in Rome. Here, excavators pulled up the floor of the church and discovered one of the largest Mithraic temples ever found. In cavernous, dark rooms like these, the Roman elite would worship in secret. This is amazing. I feel like I'm in the Notre Dame Cathedral of <laughs> Mithraism. Well, this is a pretty sizable one. The idea is, is this is a recreation of the primal cave where Mithras commits the sacrifice of the bull, which is the core event in Mithraism. The one source of light in this dark temple illuminates the centerpiece, a bas-relief that depicts the main myth of Mithraic belief. Jutting out from the primordial rock, the sun god Mithras, the son of the sun, slaughters the sacrificial bull. And through the shedding of his blood, the universe is created anew. Essentially what we're seeing is Mithras being seen as the key creator god who makes possible the regeneration of life. And you've got the primordial rock, you know, mm -hmm. the cocoon out of which the whole universe is born. Impressive, but it also sounds pretty pagan. And yet, a strange inscription here suggests a more Christian approach. We don't have many inscriptions of Mithras. Right. It's a secret, and they didn't write that much. This is unusual, this place, that it does have a very faded inscription. That know? is correct. One particular text, the Latin translates as, and you have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. You have saved yes. us through the shedding of the eternal blood. Yes. So here, the central bloodletting yes. is seen as an act of salvation. Yes, and the, the key event in the whole nature of cosmic creation and the whole nature of life. Mithras sacrifices the bull and spills its blood, strangely corresponding to the Christian concept of Jesus offering his own blood to save mankind. But the similarities don't end there. A lot of the Mithraic rituals very closely corresponded to what the Christians would do in their worship. The sacred meal that they would participate in is taking the body or the blood of this sacrifice by sharing a meal of bread and wine. Here? Here. So it's communion. It's a basically a communion, a Eucharist. And those who partake in this feast will live forever. So just as Christians reenact the Last Supper with Jesus before his death, a form of communion was also practiced here. And just as Jesus died and was resurrected, so was Mithras, which is why at this altar, Mithras is pictured right next to a sculpture of an Egyptian god. And this particular god, if you look carefully at his forehead, you notice that little lock that hangs yeah. down there? That actually would signify that he is the reconfiguration of the god Osiris. And Osiris is the dying exactly. and resurrected right. god of the Egyptians. Right. Just like Christians, Mithraeus believed in the concept of resurrection, which may explain why both religions were popular to members of the Roman military. Faced with the daily risk of death, who wouldn't put their faith in the possibility of resurrection and eternal life? But what's most compelling is evidence that Mithras' followers celebrated his holy birth on December 25th, the same day that Christians would later celebrate the birth of Jesus. It was shocking to me when I learned that nobody talked about Jesus' birthday as December 25th when, right. when Jesus <laughs> was walking the earth. Yes. It was Mithras' birthday. That is correct. And this is because December 25th was, for the Romans, always a traditional important holiday, the Feast of the Saturnalia, which went on for 12 days. <laughs> and everybody was expected to give presents during oh my that goodness. time period. And so, so suddenly 12 days, gift giving, December 25th. And a lot of these symbols do find their way into Christian iconography. As it turns out, Mithraism is embedded in the Gospels themselves through the story of the three wise men. 
At the Church of St. Apollinaire Nuovo in Ravenna, Italy, the iconography is still Mithraic. Here we have the three wise men, also known as the Magi. This is the scene as recounted at the birth of Christ, that these three wise men are bringing these gifts to the Christ child. And the hats that they're wearing, in Greco-Roman art, this sort of became the standard hat that would be used in their artwork to denote somebody who's an Easterner. But these hats weren't worn by just any non-Christian from the East. Called Phrygian caps, they were the official hats of the Mithraic priesthood, also known as the Magi. Even Mithras is depicted wearing the same style of hat. And although there are no Christian symbols on the Arch of Constantine, the arch is literally ringed by eight Magi-looking figures wearing the Phrygian hats of the Mithraic priesthood. But if Constantine was the worshiper of a sun god, how could he have championed Christianity unless he created a new version of Christianity, partially fashioned in the image of Mithraism? To do that, he would have had to convince Christians that he was one of them, while in reality supporting the introduction of pagan ideas into their faith. And to do that, I believe Constantine needed the help of someone someone working on the inside of the early Christian church. Constantine is known to history as the emperor who converted the Roman Empire to the teachings of Jesus. But the Arch of Constantine has no Christian symbolism on it whatsoever. And evidence found beneath the first Christian churches suggests that Constantine fused Mithraism with Christianity to win the patronage of the powerful Roman elite. But this leaves one problem. How could Constantine get true Christians to go along with his version of their faith? And what about the founding fathers of the church? After years of persecution, of worshiping in secret, surely they wouldn't let Constantine manipulate their religion for his gain. Or would they? There's compelling evidence to suggest that Constantine's vision was a postscript to what really happened at the Milvian Bridge. As it turns out, while Constantine was still alive, there was only one church father who recorded Constantine's life and his celebrated conversion to Christianity. His name was Eusebius, and besides becoming Constantine's sole biographer, he also became Constantine's right-hand man in the Christian world. According to Eusebius' writings, it's here at the Milvian Bridge, north of Rome, that Constantine had a vision of the cross and a dream about Jesus that inspired him to win the battle and change the world forever. So here's the Milvian Bridge. This is the bridge that gets associated with the battle. So this bridge behind you becomes, in a sense, a metaphor for the change of human history. Yes. The bridge becomes a way to refer to, not necessarily the battle itself, but the consequences of the battle. Yet in Eusebius' first draft of this account, he doesn't mention Constantine's vision at all. No vision, no dream yet. So Eusebius' first account of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge that took place somewhere right where we're standing, even Eusebius, who's like, yes. a, church father, bishop, great yes. admirer of Constantine, does not mention visions. In that account, no. Without a vision of Jesus, how did Constantine convince his contemporaries that he had converted to Christianity? Eusebius' own writings suggest that Constantine persuaded Eusebius to rewrite his account of the Milvian Bridge during a great banquet that Constantine held for the leaders of the Christian church in the year 325. After years of persecution, Eusebius and his fellow bishops were now being hosted by the emperor himself. And it seems that it was at this banquet, 13 years after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, that Eusebius first heard anything about Constantine's vision. So Constantine tells the story about the vision of the cross before the battle at the Milvian Bridge. When Constantine tells the story, he emphasizes, first of all, 
the vision of a cross in the sky at noontime. Secondly, he then had a dream in which Jesus Christ himself appeared and explained the vision to him. Almost he, like a, he's a prophet. He has visions, he has dreams. Jesus speaks to him. Precisely. And here, in these original texts by Eusebius, one can see the impact of Constantine's story on Eusebius and his fellow bishops. So here's Eusebius' description of the banquet. He compares this banquet with the emperor to the coming of Jesus. And Christians had anticipated if there was going to be a Christian ruler, it might well be Jesus come back to earth. And now suddenly it turns out to be the emperor himself. Now portrayed as a Christ-like figure, Constantine turned his so-called vision into the official history. And that history was soon propagated by Christian art. Here we have Raphael. Yes. Now Raphael, when he paints, he paints the vision in the sky. It's a cross by this right. sign you will conquer and so on. This is mythology becoming history. Yes. Even without knowing the narrative, you just want to stare at these frescoes. So this is sort of a last attempt to reaffirm this papal narrative, which had already been shown to be a fiction. A myth based not on history, but on a fiction. But if Eusebius' biography of Constantine represents the myth, what did Constantine really believe in? The only direct link we have to Constantine is his arch, which is adorned by pagan symbols. But on it, we can also see reliefs depicting three former emperors. The philosopher Marcus Aurelius, the conqueror Trajan, and the statesman Hadrian all stolen from previous monuments and strategically recycled for his arch. Begging the question, why would Constantine decorate a monument to his own achievements with reliefs taken from other emperors, unless he was really saying something about himself? Isn't he telling us what everybody thinks are winners are really losers, and me, I'm, I'm the real winner. At the end of the day, I'm going to refashion the world in a way that Hadrian Trajan and Marcus Aurelius could not even imagine. I would agree with you that Constantine would have been very happy if people looking at his arch had been able to take away the message that he is going to supersede the legacy of even Rome's best previous emperors. But how was he going to do that? The answer may lie at the very top of the arch. Here, there is an inscription, and it states in Latin, Instinctu Divinitatis, which describes Constantine as divinely inspired. But if it's not Jesus who's inspiring him, which God is? When looking at what's depicted on his arch, what we find are pagan gods from the Roman pantheon, and none so prominently rendered as the sun god Apollo. The light is amazing. And it's so appropriate with the rising of the sun god right there to have it illuminated by the sun this way. Before Constantine's alleged vision, he followed the official religion of the Roman Empire, the imperial cult, a pagan religion that worshiped Apollo above all else. Much like the pagan god Mithras, Apollo was the sun god that represented the light of creation. According to the imperial cult, Constantine, as emperor, was a superhuman avatar, the link between Apollo and the rest of humanity. And from the archaeology, it's clear that Constantine bought into this idea completely. He commissioned this 12-meter statue of himself. And not surprisingly, the statue came with an enormous head. Built into this statue's healthy hairline may be evidence that Constantine believed he was more than a mere representative of Apollo. There are dowel holes that certainly were for some kind of insert, and it seems likely that it was for a rayed crown. That's not Christian to me. To me, that's saying, I am God. 
Right. There's absolutely no humility uh, in any of Constantine's self-fashioning. I mean, he's very happy to have a 40-foot tall statue of himself looming over this space in the center of Rome. He allows cities in the north of Italy to erect cults to his family, to worship him as a god. He is aloof, he's yes. giant, and he's yes. godlike. Yes, he's superhuman. He is superhuman. The image of Constantine with sun rays emanating from his head not only matches the earliest images of Apollo, it also matches the iconography of Mithras. And is it just coincidence that Christian art begins to depict Jesus the same way, with a halo of light around his head? Or was Constantine combining all the gods of light into one? When Constantine claimed to have had a vision of the Melvian Bridge, which religion was Constantine truly embracing? Did Constantine abandon paganism for Christianity? Or did he blend Apollo and Mithras into Jesus Christ and then refashion all three in his own image? As it turns out, when Constantine had his arch built, he topped it off with a bronze portrait of himself. Destroyed in antiquity, this statue depicted him riding the same kind of chariot as Apollo, seemingly taking off into sunny skies. Constantine is known to history as the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, legalize it, and thereby change the world. But the archeology span he left behind suggests an alternative history. His triumphal arch is covered with pagan symbols, and from the statues he erected of himself, it seems that Constantine not only worshiped pagan gods, he saw himself as having a special relationship with them. If Constantine saw himself as divinely ordained, he would have seen his reign as a new founding. He would have believed that he was responsible for changing the course of human history. And the new founding needs a new capital. Rome would no longer do. So he went to what is today Istanbul in modern-day Turkey, and he founded a new capital for his new empire. He didn't name it after Jesus or the apostles. Rather, he stayed true to his nature, and he named it after himself. He called the new city Constantinople. He left Rome, and he certainly never returned there again. Settled on this incomparable site. It bridges the two continents. It's strategically and tactically located in, in virtually an ideal position, easily defended. And I think he wanted a monument to himself. He wanted his own city with his own imprint on it. Despite Constantine's reputation as the first Christian emperor, the most dominant feature of Constantinople's skyline was not a Christian church, but a giant column that was once topped by a huge bronze statue of the sun god, Apollo. The statue is long gone, and the column is under renovation. But at the time of Constantine, people were worshiping the sun god here. When the city was built, this was a big plaza or forum, and that column was in the center of it. It's about 100 feet in the air. What's significant about it is that in subsequent years, Christian bishops and theologians were very upset about the fact that the people of Constantinople conducted divine services here. And yet, Constantine's statue of Apollo was not like other pagan images. He did make a slight modification to it. He replaced Apollo's face with his own. But what's even better is the tradition continues that in this statue, he put a relic of the true cross. So he's attaching relics of Jesus to, or inserting them in this statue. So he erects a statue of himself, and this statue depicts him as Apollo, but for good measure, we've got a little bit of the true cross mixed in. Yes. Did Constantine pull off the greatest hoax of all time by pretending to be a Christian? Was he actually equating himself with both Apollo and Jesus? Or did he merely see himself as their special emissary? To find out, Simca returns to the arch, but this time 
he's not looking at what's on the arch. This time, he's looking at how the arch was positioned. From this bird's eye view, he is reminded that Constantine's arch is off-center by almost two meters from the original road that ran through it. But why? The Romans were famous for their feats of engineering. Surely they wouldn't make a mistake when building the emperor's new arch. There had to be some other reason, a reason that must be hiding in plain sight. Based on ancient records, we know that during Constantine's time, there was a colossal statue that stood 108 meters behind the arch. But this was not just any statue. It was a 30 meter high monument to Apollo. Is there a connection between the statue and the arch? Expert Elizabeth Marlowe thinks she's found that connection. So then I started playing around on the living room floor in my apartment, where I made a little cutout of the arch and I propped it up and I got a doll and I set him up and then set the arch up in front of him and I worked out the proportions very carefully, lying down and peering through the central passageway. For me, that was the aha moment. Based on her living room reconstructions, Marlo came up with a compelling new theory as to why Constantine's arch was built where it was. But to prove her theory, Marlo first had to brave rush hour Roman traffic so that she could gain the right perspective. The evidence on the ground confirmed her hypothesis. Constantine's arch was built off center on the road so as to perfectly frame the Colossus of Apollo behind it. According to Marlowe, as you entered Rome, you would have seen Apollo's head looming above the statue of Constantine on his arch, as if watching over Constantine. But as you moved closer to the arch itself, the sun god would have dropped below Constantine until he was left standing in the center of the main archway. At the point when the statue is framed in the central passageway, it is the figure of Constantine that is now looming above in the sky. As the sun is setting, what is rising is... is Constantine, yes, yes. The arch is literally a reframing of the sun god with Constantine on top of the arch. Marlowe has revealed a clear example where, on the surface, Constantine seems to be putting himself under Apollo, but covertly, he is letting us know that he is greater than Apollo. Can it be that he did the same with Christianity, seemingly worshiping Jesus while replacing Jesus with himself? Our investigation has revealed that Constantine merged the great pagan sun gods Mithras and Apollo and replaced their images with his own. Maybe that's not blasphemy by Christian standards, but it does tell us what Constantine thought of himself. By depicting himself with rays of light coming out of his head, Constantine was telling the world that he was to be worshiped as a god. Now, where does that leave Christianity? Was Constantine willing to step aside and bow down to the king of the Jews as any Christian would? I don't think so. I think Constantine took Jesus and refashioned him in his own image thereby turning the anti-Roman rebel we read about in the Gospels into a symbol of Roman imperialism. To find evidence for this, Simca travels to the Archbishop's Chapel in Ravenna, Italy, where there's a sixth century mosaic that depicts Jesus in a whole new light. That's a mosaic of Jesus dressed as a Roman soldier. Although if you look at it more carefully, you can see that he's actually a Roman emperor dressed for command. He's got the military equipment, and of course he has the cross over his shoulder. So when you can kind of see that Christ is also taking on the, the role of being the Roman emperor. He's being, depicted as the emperor. As the emperor in a military role. So Constantine didn't start running around dressed like Jesus. Right. He got Jesus to dress like him. Right. The irony is that after Constantine, Jesus, who had been crucified by the Roman army, was now depicted as its leader. But what was Constantine's goal? Was he trying to change Jesus? 
or was he trying to replace him? To answer this question, Simca now looks into the plans Constantine made for his own funeral. Well, he was actually buried in, uh, in Constantinople in the Church of the Holy Apostles, which no longer exists. It was reported that he was buried with the 12 apostles surrounding him. So Constantine prepares his burial by creating a real coffin for himself. Right. And then these pretend coffins for the other disciples. Right. If you take Jesus' place, one way to interpret it is that I, I am Jesus. Well, you could see it that way. On Earth, the Roman emperors do become the stand-in for Jesus, because now with the Christian Roman Empire, the emperor takes on the role as being the leader of the worldwide Christian community. But by taking Jesus' place, did Constantine see himself as someone who could promote Jesus' message? or subvert it? Can the arch also answer this question? From this high vantage point, Simca suddenly makes a discovery that would have never occurred to him below. How you position something relative to something else, that's sacred geometry. He's essentially putting himself in a relationship with the Flavians. Just on the other side of Constantine's arch is the famous Colosseum built by the Emperor Vespasian Flavius. Across on the left is a triumphal arch built by the same Emperor's son, Titus Flavius. And in the center, where there is now a circular depression in the grass, once stood a giant fountain built by Vespasian's other son, Domitian Flavius, one of the greatest persecutors of early Christianity. Why would Constantine want to associate himself so intimately with the Flavian dynasty? As it turns out, the first century Flavian emperors have gone down in history as the men who destroyed Jerusalem and the holy temple in it. They could literally boast that they had torched the house of God. Jesus wept for the destruction of the temple in contrast, by positioning his arch in close proximity to the destroyers of the temple, Constantine was permanently linking his legacy with theirs. But if that wasn't enough, he celebrated the Flavian name as his own. He called himself Flavius Constantinus. Could it be that just as the Flavians boasted that they had defeated the God of Israel, Constantine's scheme to defeat the religion that worshiped Jesus as God's son. But as we have seen, Constantine was going to do it, not by oppressing Christianity, but by adopting it. Not by defeating it, but by defining it. He would out Flavian the Flavians. He wouldn't fight people, he would fight their ideas. He would defeat Jesus by transforming him from a crucified Judean rebel into a Roman emperor. For 1,500 years, people accepted the story that Constantine was a true Christian, that he had a vision of the cross, and that he converted a pagan Roman empire to Christianity. But our investigation has revealed another story, one that isn't particularly Christian. We're not the first. Other investigators have noticed discrepancies in Constantine's character, but they concluded that maybe he wasn't religious. Maybe he was just pragmatic. But maybe he was religious after all. Not in a Christian sense, but in a pagan sense. It seems that he put his faith in the sun. He believed in the sun's only begotten son, himself. Christian tradition tells us that the Roman army crucified Jesus in the first century AD, then went on to persecute Christians for the next 300 years. But is it possible that the religion of Jesus was actually spread by the very same people who nailed him to the cross? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovich, From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, 
Simca tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Back in the first century AD, the Roman Imperial Army occupied Judea and was known as the most brutal military force the world had ever seen. Made up of 30 legions, each with approximately 6,000 men, the army was paid to put down anyone who defied Roman occupation. According to the Christian Gospels, Jesus of Nazareth did just that. Branded as a heretic by the Jewish authorities and prosecuted as an anti-Roman rebel by the Roman governor, he was publicly executed by crucifixion in the year 30 AD, forcing his followers to worship in secret for fear of persecution at the hands of the Roman army. And yet, just outside the ancient city of Jericho, there is evidence that the same Roman army that oppressed Christians may have been secretly worshiping Jesus. Less than three kilometers from where the Roman army was garrisoned in the year 70 AD, there is a cave that seems to have been used as a church as early as the first century. Simca has come here with the man who discovered the cave, archaeologist Yuval Peleg. The Roman military was around here, right? הצבא הרומי מגיע בשנת 68 בקיץ במסגרת הדיכוי של המרד הגדול, הוא מגיע מהצפון, מגיע ליריחו. Right over here, right? Like... שני קילומטר, שלושה קילומטר yeah. בערך, ומחכה שם לקראת העלייה לכיוון ירושלים. Pelig believes that the cave contains important archaeological information that may date to the time of the Roman occupation. Simka wants to go down and take a closer look but the cave is known to harbor a potentially fatal disease called cave fever, which is carried by ticks that live in the rocks. So before descending into it, both Simca and Yuval have to protect themselves. But you know what? This is a great natural church. <laughs> it's like the Notre Dame Cathedral of the Dead Sea area. As Simca goes deeper, it becomes apparent that this cave was once used as a church. Inside the cave's belly, Yuval Peleg shows Simca the image of a cross carved into stone. Based on its design, it appears to be one of the earliest. You know what that is? That's a fish. The image of the fish is one of the first Christian symbols and was used as a secret handshake amongst early Christian believers. Is it possible that this was a secret church? This is, this is like an altar. You've got two crosses, a candle over here in the middle. But who were the people worshiping here? The answer may be provided by the symbol found next to the cross. The Roman sun god, Saul Invictus. The sun is a very important symbol in the Roman army, for example, Apollo, Sol Invictus. Romans worship the sun as the supreme god. But here it is with a vertical line dividing it into two. Could this solar disk be how the first Roman Christians tried to integrate the Christian idea of the father and the son into the Roman belief in the sun? So is it possible that this cave was a secret church for Roman soldiers from the nearby camp? Simca is now shown another symbol that may answer that question, a symbol that looks remarkably like a Roman military standard known as the Aquila. A banner topped by an eagle, its wings spread wide in the shape of an upside-down triangle. 
I think it's an amazing thing. In a place where you have purposeful crosses, you also have something purposeful that looks like a standard, some kind of flag with a cross in the middle. Like it flows down. It could be even cloth or something. We have a puzzle. We have a sun, crosses, some kind of symbol. Here in this hole in the ground in the middle of the desert, there are symbols that if properly decoded, may tell us how Christianity left the Holy Land and spread across the entire globe. First clue, fish. Which tells us that this is an early Christian place. Second clue, crosses. Which tells us that this isn't a single monk making one cross, this is a congregation. And the fact that it's underground tells us that this congregation is worshiping in secret. Now, since we're in Israel and all of Jesus' earliest followers were Jewish, you'd expect to find Jewish symbols in there. But you don't. Instead, what you find is the Roman sun god. And what looks like a Roman military standard. So is it possible that instead of suppressing Christianity and oppressing Christianity, some early Roman soldiers were actually spreading the faith? Before 2,000 years of history can be overturned based on scratches of a fish and a Roman military standard, Simca will have to find more evidence. So he now heads to Megiddo, called Armageddon in the Christian Bible. It's here, right next to what is now a maximum security prison, that archaeologist Yotam Tefer has found a compelling connection between the Roman army and the world's first Christians. In the second century, the Sixth of Earth Legion came here between Tel Megiddo, where we're standing now, and Megiddo prison, in the big field over there. So the Sixth Ferrata Legion was camped right there, the Roman yeah. military. Yeah. They're basically occupying Judea. They control the, the north part of, of the country. It was during Tefer's excavation of the camp that inmates from the prison made their own amazing discovery while digging the foundations of a new cell block. What they found were the ruins of a Jewish village that bordered on the Roman camp the Tefer was excavating outside the prison. And there, right where the village and the camp met, on the Roman military side, they found a mosaic containing images of fish. At first, they believed the fish were simply decorations, but as excavations continued, they found a definite link to Christianity. The first inscription uh, it was uh, dedicated to Jesus Christ. we found another two inscriptions. The last one, talking about Roman army officer, centurion, that give the money for the flow. So, so this mosaic, there's an inscription dedicating dedic it. Dedicated by a Roman officer. It was confirmed. The mosaic belonged to a house church that was built by a Roman centurion. It was positioned on the border between the Jewish village and the Roman camp conclusive evidence that rather than oppressing the first Christians, at least some Roman soldiers were offering them shelter, a place where both Roman soldiers and Jewish villagers could worship Jesus together. But were they practicing Christianity as we know it today? Just like the sun symbol found in the cave near Jericho, the centurion's dedication may hint at a pagan sensibility. The mosaic says, dedicated to the God, Jesus Christ. But the New Testament never refers to Jesus as a God, suggesting that the Romans who worshiped here thought of Jesus as one of many gods, rather than part of the one true God. To their amazement, right next to the fish, Tefer's team also discovered remnants of a stone table leading him to believe that the type of worship that was going on here was already highly ritualized. 
Do you think this table is really a precursor to an altar? Yeah, later on it became the, an altar, yeah. To share a communal meal. But and this is huge, taking communion, eating together, Jews and Gentiles. And you found this we, we right found at the edge between Romans and Jews. Yeah, Romans and Jews, they living together. Now, this is like 100 years before Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. This is why it's so important, because if you put everything together, it's evidence of Christian religion in the Roman army. But was this Christianization only happening in the Holy Land? Or could it be that just as in Jericho and Megiddo, secret Christians in the Roman army were spreading the faith to Roman forts throughout the empire? To answer this, Simca's investigation leads him to the largest Roman military base in the ancient Near East, the stronghold of Dura Europis. The conventional wisdom is that the world's first Christians were Jews and that they were persecuted by the Roman army. To escape, they fled north to modern-day Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey. But we've seen evidence that as early as the second century, some Roman soldiers were Christianized. So is it possible that the world's first Christians went north not because the Roman army was persecuting them, but because they were sheltering them? Not because they were fleeing from the Roman army, but rather because they were following the Roman legions northward. To find the answer, Simca has followed the trail of the Roman army here to the Syrian desert, to a city the Romans occupied in the second century. This stronghold had been buried under desert sands for some 1,600 years. Then, in 1920, a soldier digging a trench accidentally discovered it. When archaeologists began excavating, they soon realized it was the long-lost city of Dura Europis. Because of politics, it's impossible to travel from Israel to Syria. So Simca must ask his friend, archaeologist Dino Politis, to investigate these Roman ruins for signs of Christian worship. Ségolène de Pontbriand has been helping to unearth the city's remains for the past two years. We call Dura the Pompeii of the desert, yeah. which is very incredible to have all this building in the same place. Despite the common belief that Christians weren't worshiping openly in the first centuries for fear of Roman persecution, archaeologists here uncovered evidence to the contrary. Not just a house church hidden in a soldier's home, but the world's oldest Christian church. Here in Dura, what's, what's the best evidence that we have Christians? You are going to see the most important, which is the Christian building. This big door is the entrance for the, the main room. I think it's the oldest we have in the world. When archaeologists found the church, they also discovered the world's oldest Christian frescoes. However, they have since been sent to Yale University. The frescoes are proof that Christians weren't just getting by at Jury Europus, they were flourishing here. In one of the frescoes, there is an early symbol of Christianity. There is a good shepherd just over here. You can see the sky, also the shepherd here, and is holding a sheep. Early on, the good shepherd became a symbol of Jesus, borrowed from the god Attis, worshipped in the Roman army. This is the first proof for Christian art. It's very important. When first discovered, this corner contained a baptismal font, proof that the people who worshipped here were open about their Christianity and were even baptizing new converts. Finding this Christian church isn't enough to prove that Roman soldiers were taking up the faith here, but it does tell us that Christians were being tolerated. There are Christians obviously living and painting beautifully their, their walls yeah. when Christianity is supposed to be illegal. But here there's no problem? Th there is no problem. Does all this demonstrate that Roman soldiers were converting to Christianity? Unlike the cave near Jericho, where we found Roman military symbols next to crosses, 
This church has no explicit Roman army symbols. So if Roman soldiers weren't worshiping here, where did they worship? Just down the street from the church, excavations have unearthed a temple devoted to the goddess Artemis. We are in the temple of Artemis, dated from the first century AD. So Roman pagan period. Yeah. Artemis was a fertility deity. She was the most popular goddess of the pagan world. Her cult was centered in Ephesus, modern Turkey. Here in Dura Europus, her temple was found right next to the Roman commander's house, known as the Praetorium. You can see um, this is a meeting room with some stairs. You can have a yes. seat. Yes, we can see. I and can see inscriptions too. In Greek. Yes. This is the name of the person who are sitting here. Strangely, none of these inscriptions refer to the goddess Artemis. But right above a stone seat that was inscribed with one worshiper's name, archaeologists found a cryptic symbol painted on the wall. The symbol is called the Satyr Square, or Magic Box. Not only does it predate the Christian church down the street, it might just hold a secret Christian message. They have found uh, four Satyr Square, actually. Yeah. This is in this very temple. It was on a plaster. Just like, like that. This is a Roman inscription. And it could be like a code for the Christian. A it's uh, for sure a soldier inscriptions. Is it possible that Ségolène de Pombriand is right? Could this be a secret Christian code that was used by Roman soldiers? The Satyr Square is made up of five Latin words. Rotus, Opera, Tenet, Arepo, and Seder. But the square is also a palindrome, which means the same words can be read forwards and backwards, top to bottom. Always the same. So Rotus read backwards becomes Seder. And opera read backwards is a repo. But then, hinged on the letter N, the word tenet remains the same. This appears strikingly similar to the cross found in the cave at Jericho. In the church at Dura, people worshiped Christianity openly. But in the army, where it was illegal, they may have needed the square to communicate their secret faith. Perhaps the square is a code within a code. To find out, we'll need to decipher the square. Dino now travels to the museum in Damascus. Rumor has it that right after they were discovered, three of the four squares were put into storage here. You are uh, responsible for the classical yes. section of the museum here. Also. Behind the museum's main displays, the curator takes Dino to the back storage rooms, where sure enough, there's Christian artifacts from Jura Europus, which haven't been examined for almost a century. Nobody's seen them. No. So these were wall plaster yes. taken from Dura. Yes. Dino immediately sees an image that looks like a Roman military sign. But instead of containing a vertical line, like the one Simca found at the cave near Jericho, this one contains a full cross. Does this once again illustrate how the first Roman Christians blended Christian imagery with their own pagan beliefs? Something here. Something here. Suddenly, Dino sees a striking figure, a pictograph that looks like Jesus, arms spread wide in what scholars call the Orante position, a symbol of piety. Here, there is a sun clearly visible behind Jesus' head, perhaps the oldest depiction of Jesus ever found, an image that would come to dominate Christian art for millennia. And right next to this image is an armored horse, evidence of a Roman military presence. 
Unfortunately, nowhere in the museum's artifacts can Dino find the satyr squares that he had come here to investigate. We have nothing like this here. No. Do you know the last time this was seen? Have you ever seen this? No. No. At Dura Europa, we've seen evidence of the earliest Christian church, a place where they were baptizing people and gaining converts. But what about evidence of Christians in the Roman army? Well, they did find there four Sator squares. Is it possible that as Roman emperors began to persecute Christians, the newly minted Christians in the Roman army adopted the square as their secret symbol? Is it possible that the army that had crucified Jesus was now spreading Christianity in his name? Simca is searching for evidence that the same Roman army that persecuted Christians was actually spreading its teachings behind the backs of its anti-Christian emperors. So far, his investigation has turned up images that seem to be fusing Christian ideas with Roman sun worship all found in military camps throughout the Near East. He has also found an ancient symbol called the Sator Square. Does this Latin palindrome contain a hidden code that was used by secret Christians in the Roman army? The answer may be found here in the ancient ruins of Pompeii. Once a center of Roman culture, it was destroyed in the year 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius erupted, showering Pompeii with fire and ash. Buried for almost 2,000 years under six meters of pumice, Pompeii is the perfect portrait of Roman life, frozen in time, just 49 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. In the ruins, Archaeologists uncovered the remains of an ancient training facility for Roman soldiers. What suggests that this is a military place? We have a couple of graffiti on the columns here that do suggest that there were soldiers here. We're in what's been called a palestra or a campus. This could have been like the campus martius in Rome where the military could go and practice. Surprisingly, in the ancient graffiti that was etched into one of these columns, archaeologists discovered the oldest Seder square ever found. The square itself no longer exists, but there's photographic evidence of the exact spot where it was carved. That's the exact spot. It's, it is right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's as though we're looking at it. To get to the hidden layers of the square, Simca asks Professor Benefil to explain the plain meaning of the words. People have suggested that you could translate it this way, sator, the sower. Arepo is not a Latin word, so it's been suggested that that's just a name. Tenet holds opera, work. Rotos, the wheels. Arepo, the sower, holds the wheels in work. And it's thought that there could be a sense of, you know, you must work hard, reap what you sow, all these different things. It doesn't make a fabulous sentence, but there's not an obvious meaning, and so... What's your gut feel? What's going on with this box? I think that this was a game that anyone could play when you're relaxing or waiting in the shade on a hot summer day, um, and that's maybe why it got written up here. So was the Sator Square nothing more than a game? A meaningless distraction for Roman soldiers with a lot of time on their hands. I'm not convinced. If it was a game, what were the rules? And how much fun could it be playing with a sentence that basically tells you to work hard? I think when it comes to the Sator Square, there's a lot more than meets the eye. But to prove it, I'll need a second opinion. And who better than an expert on ancient games? Simca now travels to the British Museum in London, which houses the largest collection of Roman artifacts in the world. It's here that he meets with ancient games expert Irving Finkel. The Romans liked to carve their war games in public places, on pavements and on stone. And sometimes the points of the game, instead of being just with dots or something, were actually laid out with letters which read together made sense. And then you encounter the Sartor opera. You think to yourself, oh, this is some kind of five by five game, but I'm fairly sure that it's nothing to do with that whatsoever, and it has to be separated and regarded 
as an altogether different category. L let me see if I understand. You're saying, given what you know about games, this is not a game. I'm certain it's not a game, yes. Because the kind of place that it's found, coupled with the amount of labour it costs to carve it on stone, which is not a slight matter, means that it had more significance than that. And since the primary significance is so unclear, I should think the secondary underneath significance is the real one. You think it has meaning? It certainly has meaning, because you don't find lots of Latin inscriptions which are meaningless. Dr. Finkel has confirmed Simca's original suspicions. The Seder Square is definitely not an ancient Roman game. But does it contain a hidden Christian meaning? In an attempt to decipher the square, scholars considered whether the surface meaning of the words were a diversion. So they scrambled the letters to see which Latin phrases they could build. What they came up with ranged from the political, the one in power is at fault, to the demonic, Satan, cruel in all your works. But most were simply absurd. He terrifies the rutabagas, leading most researchers to believe that the square was nothing more than a collection of random words chosen only for their ability to fit the design. To find out how random these five words really are, Simka has called on the help of computer scientist and medical research professor Michael Brudno, who uses mathematical formulas to determine the randomness of human DNA sequences. Simka has asked him to apply the same techniques to see whether the square's letters conceal a secret code. You're looking for things which happen by chance uh, very often and trying to tease apart, is there a hope of this being non-random? Professor Brudno assembles a database of all the five-letter words in the Latin language that can be read both forwards and backwards to see how many five-word squares can be built. The results are astonishing. So from these, we built 50,000 squares. So, 50,000 squares. So 50,000 square. squares, that's a lot of squares. It's right now generating all 50,000 squares. Of the 50,000 word squares that the computer generated, only the Sater Square's debatable message of holds the wheels in work appears to have any metaphorical value whatsoever. So what does this tell you as a kind of a pattern finder? These squares are hard to build. With 21st century technology, it took us a couple of weeks to get to sort through all of them. The person who found these put in some time into this. So it seems unlikely that the Seder Square was just a random invention. It must have had some kind of meaning. What do you think? I think the person came in with an intuition that these are the letters which I want. Because if he chose pretty much any other letters, the person wouldn't have succeeded in building the square. So the Sator Square was not a Roman game after all. It seems to have had a hidden meaning built into it from the outset. But did that meaning have anything to do with being a secret Christian in the Roman army? To find that out, I'm going to have to go to the other end of the empire, to the forts of Hadrian's Wall. If I can find a Sator Square there, then maybe I can prove that this is the cryptic symbol behind the spread of Christianity. Simca believes that the Roman army that nailed Jesus to the cross also spread Christianity to the ends of the Roman Empire. It happened as a result of the sophisticated network of roads the Roman army built to flex its muscles over the people it ruled. The roads didn't just move soldiers, but also ideas, one of which was Christianity. So far, Simca has found evidence of Christianity among Roman soldiers serving in the Holy Land and nearby Syria. He's even found a mysterious symbol called the Seder Square that may contain a secret Christian message. But is there any evidence that Roman soldiers serving in the area of the Holy Land made it to the farthest reaches of the empire and brought Christianity with them? In Manchester, 
they found military discharge diplomas belonging to Roman soldiers from the second century AD. What have you got here? These are very helpful because they're a snapshot in time of the garrison of a province. Does the picture tell you of movement? The name of the place where he came from doesn't survive complete. It would suggest he came from Heliopolis in Syria. That's very see. close to Jesus' country. Yeah. We're talking 133, 132. Jesus was crucified in 33, which means that they could have come into contact with the very earliest Christians. It is quite possible. So soldiers from the Holy Land made it to England. But were they Christians? It seems at least some of them were, because there's evidence that Roman soldiers sent for and married Christian women. This is the tombstone of a lady called Aurelia Iyer. She herself came from Salonas, which is in modern-day Croatia, and that is one of the earliest Christian cities in mainland Europe. Um, so that suggests that she may be a Christian, and the idea is then supported by the fact that she lived without blemish. It's an epithet which tends to be used in Christian contexts. So the information pulled together suggests that this is a Christian. The tombstone shows us that not only was she a Christian, but she traveled across the Roman Empire to get married to a Roman soldier. It seems soldiers from the Holy Land traveled to Roman Britain, and some of them were sending for and marrying Christian women. But if the Roman army had a secret population of Christians, is there evidence of that in a military context? Simca now travels north to Hadrian's Wall built in the second century to defend against Celtic tribes from the north. Vindolanda was one of the military forts along the wall. It's here in the soldiers' barracks that archeologists have uncovered the foundations of a Christian church, a Christian tombstone, crosses, and a so far undeciphered symbol carved into a portable altar. This sun cross reminds us of the ones we found at the cave outside Jericho and at Dura Europus. But it has evolved even further. It's now more like an abstract portrait of the crucifixion. Further evidence that Roman soldiers were fusing both pagan and Christian ideas into one and that they were carrying those ideas with them to the farthest outposts of the Roman Empire. The most famous Christian in the Roman army is the first English martyr, St. Alban. St. Alban is said in the accounts to have been martyred by Caesar, who caused this soldier to be arrested for being a Christian, uh, refusing to carry out pagan ceremonies, and has him executed. This story demonstrates why it was important for Christians in the Roman army to keep their faith a secret and share a symbol that no one could decode. I think that the square is likely to be Christian. Christians would be able to use this as a secret uh, way of communicating with each other. To find that symbol, Simca now travels back to the city of Manchester. Once a Western outpost of the Roman Empire, it's here that archeologists uncovered the fragment of a Seder square that just might be the oldest Christian artifact ever discovered on British soil. So was this a big surprise? You could say that, yes. <laughs> it's, it's one of those um, wonder moments for an archeologist when you come across a find like this. You've recreated that around there, eh? We have enough there to enable us to be very confident in reconstruction. This is a very standard piece of Roman pottery called an amphora, and these were big storage jars which were used for olive oil, fish sauce, wine. This kind of clay jug was used to store wine, and the fact that it has the Seder Square engraved right on it strongly suggests it had a ceremonial purpose. Maybe it was used during communion. And the interesting thing with this find, it came from a rubbish pit between two buildings. Simca now finds out that the rubbish pit was located next to a Roman military fort. There would have been auxiliary soldiers bringing their religions with them, one of which would have been Christianity. 
So why not for a soldier to put this piece of graffiti on the emperor for a subverted religion that he totally believed in? So you just look at it, it's yep. some letters, but it could preserve somebody taking, risking their lives for their faith. I think it's remarkable that he's got such a small fragment, but there's such a big story. In the centuries that followed, squares just like this one found their way to Roman forts in Portugal, France, and Hungary. Wherever the Seder Square went, Christianity soon followed. But can the secret message of the Seder Square finally be decoded? Simca has found the Seder Square in a Roman military context, at the farthest outpost of the Roman Empire in both Britain and Syria. He's convinced the square holds the missing clue of how Christianity spread to the Western world but he still doesn't know what the square really means. To break the code, he's going back to where the earliest Seder Square was found, here in Pompeii. Back before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii was the Roman version of Sodom and Gomorrah. The streets were lined with brothels like this one. The walls covered with body frescoes depicting sexual pleasures that anyone could experience for a price. But not everyone in Pompeii was drunk on sex and paganism. Some people believed that Pompeii was going to be punished in the manner of the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah. Total annihilation. This piece of ancient graffiti invokes a curse against Pompeii revealing a distinctly Christian point of view. What do we make of that? You always want to start with what's the clearest, and this is a kerem, C-H-E-R-E-M, is a transliteration of a Hebrew word. And it's often in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. So it's always used for divine retributions, just blotting out. And then poinium, it's written in Latin. It's an attempt to represent a Greek word, poine, a blow or a strike. Ponium harem it means to strike with utter destruction. Exactly. And these are the five-pointed stars, Solomonic, as if to bring power to a kind of a curse, maybe. The harem curse was found in the doorway to this house. It seems to have acted as an amulet, warding off immoral activity. But who were the people who lived here? Inside, archaeologists found a fresco that depicts the owners a man named Paco Procolo and his wife. From the fresco, we learn that Paco wasn't Italian. He probably came from the Middle East. In his hands, he holds Roman citizenship, given to soldiers after 25 years of service. But is there any evidence that Paco Procolo was a Christian? From the Pompeian record, we learn that at one point, he purchased a bakery he then discovered that his building was adorned with pagan sexual imagery, which Paco felt compelled to cover up, evidenced by the remains of white plaster. Then inside, above the bakery's main furnace, archeologists uncovered a cross, strong evidence that this former Roman soldier was now practicing Christianity openly. Simca now wants to see if any other artifacts were found at Pacquo's house. Suddenly, he is presented with an inscription whose existence he was not aware of. Not a photo, not a fragment. It is the world's oldest surviving Sater Square. This is not the same house. Ah, the same house, he said. But they're saying that this Sator Square was found in the same house as the Cherem inscription. This square is dated no later than 79 AD, just 49 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. And right above the square, we also find the image of the fish, inscribed in the same style as the one found at the cave near Jericho. I think we found where the magic box came from. Clearly, the square was no game. Here it was found in a doorway alongside biblical symbols and curses. We even know the name of the former soldier who inscribed it. 
Paco Procolo. But we still don't know what it means. So Simca pays one final visit to Dr. Irving Finkel. The likelihood is that it's an early Christian device in which they wanted to write the words Pater Noster in such a way that it wasn't obvious that that's what it was. And you think it has Christian meaning? Anybody who takes the effort to write an inscription has a meaning behind it. And meaning is sometimes transparent and sometimes obscure and sometimes both at once. Dr. Finkel believes that the square refers to the phrase Pater Noster. As it turns out, when you reorder the square's 25 letters in the shape of a cross, using the square's only N as your axis, you can create the Latin phrase Pater Noster, which is translated as Our Father. The first two words of the most important Christian prayer in the Gospels. Arranging the words in this way leaves four letters outstanding, two O's and two A's which seems to represent Jesus' famous lines from the book of Revelations. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But there may be one other Christian message encoded in the square. It involves a repo, which is the only word that has no meaning in Latin. What if it is a mix of Greek and Hebrew? just like the curse found in Paco's doorway. In Greek, there is one word that sounds a lot like a repo. That word is Aleppo, which sounds like a Greek version of the Hebrew A, once again forming the Alpha and Omega. Using the word Aleppo would have ruined the palindrome, so the similar sounding Aleppo was used instead. If this is right, the Seder Square's five words read, the Alpha and Omega hold the wheels in work. In other words, decoded, the secret message that Roman soldiers were spreading is, Jesus makes God's work possible. Found with Roman and early Christian symbols, the Seder Square hides an image of the cross a secret prayer, and a concealed message, all pointing towards a Christian meaning. Found at Roman military camps across the empire, it also tells us that at a time when Christianity was an illegal movement, Roman soldiers weren't just adopting Christianity, they were adapting its symbols for their own needs, thereby shaping Christian ideas and icons for future generations of worshipers. Common perception has been that the Roman army persecuted Christians for the first 300 years after the crucifixion, and that Christianity was being spread by apostles and martyrs. But compelling new evidence suggests that this is not the whole story. Finding the Sator Square all over the Roman military world tells us at least three things. First, that Roman soldiers were risking their lives by worshiping in secret. Second, that their idea of a sun god was influencing their idea of Jesus. Third, that the religion of love was being spread not only by people fleeing the Roman army, but by people serving it. In the first century, Pompeii was the sin city of the Roman Empire. Here, Rome's elite reveled in sex and sadism. Meanwhile, the earliest followers of Jesus were preaching repentance to the Romans and predicting the end of days. And then it happened. The Vesuvius volcano erupted and wiped out Pompeii and neighboring Herculaneum. Was the eruption the best thing that could have happened to Christianity? Did Vesuvius provide Christianity with the launch it needed? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakabovich from deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land. Simca tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Volcanic eruptions have been known to influence the spread of religion. During the biblical exodus, it is said by many that the eruption of Pharaoh in Greece helped Moses by generating catastrophes recorded in the Bible 
as the plagues. In modern times, the eruption of Krakatoa caused millions to convert to Islam, making Indonesia the most populous Muslim country in the world. But what about Christianity? Does it have its own volcano? I think it does. On the morning of August 24th, 79 AD, the people of Pompeii woke up thinking that it was just another day in this playground of Rome's elite. But by 10 a.m., a slight ash started to cover everything. By two in the afternoon, the ash turned coarser, driving people indoors. Others started fleeing the city, but it was too late. By 7.30 the next morning, the volcano sent a gas cloud 20 miles into the air. Boulders of fire then rolled down the side of the mountain, incinerating everything in their path. The bodies of the inhabitants were trapped in cocoons of hot ash, creating these casts that would immortalize the dead. As it turns out, the eruption may have been the catalyst for the spread of Christianity in the Roman Empire. To understand why, we're on the trail of a 2,000-year-old mystery. The investigation begins in the city of Herculaneum, also buried by the eruption. In February of 1938, while digging up the ancient city, archaeologists discovered something that could turn biblical history upside down. Today, the public is kept away from this site. They uncovered the clear imprint of a Christian cross that had been nailed to a wall and then pried loose. This cross can date no later than 79 AD, when the city was covered in ash for two millennia. The problem is that scholars believe that the cross, as a Christian symbol, did not come into use until 300 years after Vesuvius. Few people want to challenge this opinion, and yet, in a city that was covered in ash, less than 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, here is a cross seemingly treated as a Christian symbol. How could that be anything but a cross? You see actually where it was bolted? When they found it, the floor was still there, and there are images where you had an altar in front of it and uh, a thing to kneel on. It's controversial because it's not supposed to be there, but what else can it be? This establishes crosses in 79. According to the church fathers, the earliest followers of Jesus, who were Jews, used a cross or an X as a symbol of their faith. For them, the X stood for the letter Tau, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The X symbolized the end, perfection, righteousness. The cross at Herculaneum suggests that 300 years before the Roman Empire converted to Christianity and adopted the cross as its symbol, in the Pompeii area, the Hebrew Tau was already morphing into the Gentile or Roman cross we recognize today. It's the upper room of a wealthy house. It's not really a chapel. I think it's a private bedroom of probably a Jewish or Christian slave. So I think unquestionably, in my mind, this uh, plastered remain is a cross, a T. But you know, some people will say it was too early, it couldn't be a cross, the cross is much later. Maybe it's a bookshelf, that's what people say, it's uh, a bracket. It's nonsense if you think about it. You look at the shape of it, this isn't how you would bracket a bookshelf. And then it's pried off the wall. Do you pry your bookshelf off the wall and run with it? You know, when the city's being destroyed. But the plaster tells the story. There's white plaster around it. This is to outline it and to say, this is the center of my devotion. And we have a early Christian text that's been overlooked. It's called the Letter of Barnabas. It's from the late first, early second century, so same time as the destruction of Pompeii. But the writer says that the letter T, which symbolizes the cross, stands for Jesus. To understand what Christians would be doing in the Pompeii area just 49 years after the crucifixion, the detective trail takes us back to where it all started, Jerusalem. In the year 66 AD, in Roman ruled Judea, revolution had broken out. After four years of fighting, the Romans captured Jerusalem 
and its temple, Judaism's holiest site. The Roman general Titus torched the temple and turned hundreds of thousands of Jews into slaves. Among them were the earliest Christians from places like Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Nazareth. Some of these slaves must have known Jesus. Now they found themselves in places like Rome and Pompeii. They were disgusted by what they saw, a culture where power and violence were the currency of the day, and sex was a religion. It's almost impossible to know just what to make out of all the sex in Pompeii. The way that just a great phallus can stick out uh, of a wall in a street as you walk past. If I'm a Christian or a Jew brought in as a slave to Pompeii, I'm walking down streets where there's phalluses. What would I have thought being thrown into the world that was Pompeii? I think what worries them is how they have to live. Do they have to live as slaves offering sexual services? That's where the real moral crunch will come. That's the grim law of, of, of war, that if you're defeated, you are enslaved, you're led off in captivity, and you have to do precisely the things, the giving pleasure to others, that is always unpleasant for you yourself. For these deeply religious slaves, it must have seemed as if they had stepped into Sodom and Gomorrah. And then, Nine years after the destruction of the Jewish temple, Vesuvius erupted. Ironically, Titus, the very general who had destroyed the temple, was the newly installed emperor of Rome. It certainly is very clear in the early Christian narrative that the destruction of Pompeii is a consequence of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. What's far more interesting is to see that idea take shape in the Roman consciousness, and particularly in Emperor Titus's increasing paranoia. We're talking about someone who feared fire greatly, and for good reason, given what happened in Vesuvius. He's also facing an epidemic where people are febrile all throughout Rome, and that increasing fire within made Titus take cold baths and actually bury himself in snow. It was as if he was trying to fight back the force of fire itself, because he felt as though there was something he had not fully extinguished in the Temple of Jerusalem, as though this last ember of spirit had survived, and the wrath of the God of Israel was coming for him. I believe that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79 drove thousands of Romans to join Judaism and its newly created sister religion, Christianity, especially Christianity. So I believe that while Paul gets all the credit, it's really Vesuvius that launched Christianity into a world religion. To test my thesis, I've set up a roadmap. I have to find evidence right here that there were Jews in Pompeii prior to the eruption. Why Jews? Let's remember at the beginning of the movement, they were all Jews, including Jesus and all his disciples. And secondly, I have to find evidence that these newly minted Christians, so to speak, warned their pagan Roman masters of the impending disaster. Why did they have to warn before? Well, because otherwise, the Romans wouldn't have seen the eruption of Vesuvius as divine punishment. So let's test the theory and follow the trail of evidence. We begin with the New Testament. The book of Acts describes the missionary journeys of the apostle Paul. There, it states that he made a point of preaching in busy harbor towns where new ideas would quickly spread. He actually describes coming here to Putzwale, the harbor of Pompeii. Scholars believe this journey happened around 60 AD, six years prior to the Jewish revolt against Rome and 19 years before the eruption of Vesuvius. During the beginning of the first century, all the traffic that came from all over the Mediterranean came here through Putzwale. So in the book of Acts, when Paul lands... Uh... He's landing right here. Yeah. I mean, it's no accident that he's landing here when he's going to Rome. Right. This is the way people would have traveled. The coast between the Bay of Naples and Rome was too treacherous, and so people would sail here into Pozzuoli and then travel across land to get to Rome. It says that when Paul landed right over here, mm -hmm. uh, he was met by brothers. That means fellow yeah. Jews who are followers of Jesus who had converted to 
this movement. Definitely Jews coming from the Holy Lands to Italy on their way to Rome would be passing through. That's amazing because that's Christians. Right, the religion is already spreading pretty quickly. Before so, Paul even gets here. Yeah, this is probably the Ellis Island of the ancient world. Seeking their fortunes in the capital of the empire, Jews like Paul were heading to Rome in droves. When Paul landed here in the year 60, he was put under house arrest for causing a disturbance. Two years later, he was released. And two years after that, he was beheaded. Paul was probably swept up in the mass persecutions of Christians that followed the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD. The archeological evidence of the fire is here. The Circus Maximus, a massive racetrack that could seat over a quarter of a million spectators. One night in the year 64, the stables caught fire and the city of Rome burned. The response to the fire tells us there were already a lot of Christians in Rome prior to the Vesuvius eruption. So this is a fire that destroyed three quarters of the city. This is where Nero, according to legend, was fiddling while Rome was burning. Yes. What does uh, Nero do afterwards? Well, he blames the Christians for the fire. Now, the thing is, for Nero to blame the Christians in 64, there's got to be enough of them to make yes. that ac accusation credible, right? That, that's what's amazing. I mean, here we are only in 64. In 64. 30 years after the crucifixion. And here we have him being able to say, this is a group is substantial enough. You all know who they are, and you all know that the troublemakers, they're doing illegal things, and they're the ones who are responsible for this. These early Christians, like Paul, who were blamed for the fire of Rome, were beheaded, fed to lions, and crucified for pagan Roman entertainment. Two years after the persecution of the Christians of Rome, the Jews of Judea rose in revolution. Four years after that, they were defeated. In the year 70 AD, Tens of thousands of Jewish slaves were brought to the Italian peninsula. Many of them were early Christians. New evidence suggests that with the help of a volcano, they were about to take over the Roman Empire. Most historians say that the Apostle Paul launched Christianity and the Roman Empire. But think about it. How could one man convert the most powerful empire the world had ever seen? No matter how effective Paul was at spreading the message of the Gospels, think how much more effective an act of God would be. I think that the eruption of the volcano Vesuvius in 79 AD gave Christianity a huge push, a push that history has forgotten. And the Romans would have perceived that volcanic eruption as an act of an angry God, to be precise, the God of Israel payback for Rome's destruction of the temple in Jerusalem just nine years earlier. At that time, the Romans torched the temple of Jerusalem and took tens of thousands of Jews to Rome as slaves. Many of these Jews were early Christians. To commemorate the victory over the God of Israel, the Romans built a number of monuments, including the Colosseum, they used Jewish and Christian slaves, financing the project with monies plundered from the temple. In the year 70, the Colosseum literally went up as the Jerusalem temple came down. And only a hundred yards from the Colosseum stands the Arch of Titus. The story carved on its stone surface is a boastful testimonial to the sacking of Jerusalem, a celebration of the looting of the temple's wealth and the persecution of hundreds of thousands of Jewish slaves from Judea. Oh, here we have really fantastically well-preserved example of a triumph procession. And a triumph was a mega parade. There was everybody. There was the emperor. Uh, there were slaves from the place that you conquered. There was all the spoils of war that you brought back. There was money. In this case here, they brought back the menorah from the sacking of the fabulously wealthy and ornate temple in Jerusalem. Rome destroys Jerusalem in 70. Mm -hmm. Jesus is crucified in 33. We're only talking 37 years. Right. Am I right? Some of the people following this procession mm -hmm. in chains may have actually heard Jesus preach. Yes, it's absolutely uh, within the realm of possibility. They definitely could have witnessed, seen, 
heard Jesus and then ended up as fate would have brought them as a slave to Rome. According to the Gospels, Jesus had predicted the destruction of the temple. Now that it had happened, Jews generally, and in particular the followers of Jesus, were waiting for the Romans to be punished for their deeds. In the meantime, they would have been sent to places like Pompeii, serving as slaves in opulent Roman villas such as this one. Here, the followers of the God of Israel found themselves serving pagans who worshipped many gods. Every house in Pompeii had a shrine to their domestic gods, the gods of that household. But what you could do is you would have little statuettes of the gods you want to worship, and you could pick and choose. So a lot of merchants would have Mercury because he brought profit. All these gods are there to protect. There would have been only one group, the Jews and the Jesus followers among the Jews, that would have said, God's not going to protect you. You burned down his house in Jerusalem. You're going to be punished unless you change your ways. Yeah, exactly. It's a very different way of thinking. The Romans may not have been thinking about divine punishment, but the slaves were. There's very clear evidence in, in the Acts and in other documents that Christianity was a religion that had a major appeal in the slave community. But it would be hard to get at archaeologically. In antiquity, there's a hierarchy of ways of writing. So the grandest bit, the public bit, is you take a great big piece of marble and you write in great big letters that high the name of the emperor and the official announcement. Whereas the graffito, with a, a little scratching thing, maybe a stylus or so on, written on the wall in a hurry by someone who shouldn't have been writing on the wall there, you may just catch a bit of a trace of the suppressed Christian voice. Professor Wallace is right. The suppressed voice can be heard in overlooked graffiti. The first one on the wall of an ancient toilet. Here we are in a latrine. I think this is one of the strongest pieces of evidence for the presence of Jews in Pompeii. This whole wall, basically, of the latrine is taken up with a humongous message. It's not a very nice message, but it names a woman named Martha. Hebrew. Right, it is Hebrew. And here's what it says. This is the dining room of Martha, and then at the very end, Kakat. She is defecating in her dining room. So Martha, whoever's writing about Martha, look, look at Martha, she, she craps where she eats. Yeah. But not only do we have the name Martha, triclinium, is spelled T-R-I-C-L-I-N-U-M in Latin. It's spelled as it sounds. But here, triclinium has an H in it, so it would be pronounced triclinium instead of triclinium. A Latin speaker from Italy would have never written, would have never said it that way. They would have just said triclinium. Martha and the person who's writing about her Definitely are probably right. both Jews. Yeah, and, and probably slaves. And actually, you can see that if you're sitting here using the latrine, you would be looking directly at that wall with this huge inscription that's really hard to miss. So basically, it gives us hard archaeological evidence that there were Jews, maybe Judeo-Christians, slaves in Pompeii prior to the eruption. Yes. So a crudely scratched joke on the wall of a latrine becomes solid evidence that there were Jews and perhaps Christians in Pompeii at the time of the eruption, and they were slaves. That's the key. These slaves may well have been the key players in Rome's conversion to Christianity. Think about it. Slaves like Martha may have heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and yet ended up in a Pompeii brothel. I'm convinced that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii and neighboring Herculaneum also helped launch Christianity in the Roman world. So far, we've shown evidence that Hebrew and perhaps Christian slaves were living in Pompeii at the time of the eruption. We've also seen that one of these slaves had the Hebrew name Martha. The evidence suggests that people like Martha helped convert Rome from paganism to Judaism and especially Christianity. But when she got here, the best Martha could hope for was to be a household servant. The alternative was life in a brothel. Here we go. 
Here we're in the Hi. hallway. It's smaller than a real Yeah, this is the first room. They had cushions on these beds, right? They did. There would have been cushions. Pompeii was a really busy city with people traveling through. And this was a place where you could meet people from all over. Are these free women or slaves? These are probably slaves. I know some people see this as erotic. It's quite violent. Well, if you were a slave in the ancient world, you really didn't have much control over your life. So it was certainly not a very nice existence. But is there any evidence that some of these women who ended up in this brothel were Christians, brought as slaves after the fall of Jerusalem? Just across the street, there is a building known as the Hotel of the Christians. And we're heading into the atrium. This is called the Hotel of the Christians, partly because there are many small rooms around the atrium, so it's thought that this could have served as some sort of hospitality establishment, but of the Christians, because very early on in 1862, there was discovered a very enigmatic graffito. But there's this one word that has fascinated everyone, Christianos. This charcoal graffiti had been preserved under ash for 1,800 years until archaeologists uncovered it. Exposed, it became susceptible to the elements. Because it was written in charcoal, it just needed a few rains and some sun, and it disappeared within two years. But in the short time between its discovery and its disappearance, there was only time for two experts to make tracings of it. So everyone has been working off of these tracings that were done in 1862. Then it would be the earliest archaeological attestation to the word Christian anywhere. Christianos, yeah, as, as an identity. Now, the problem was that nobody could make heads or tails of it, correct? Pretty much. There's a lot of writing, obviously. It's more than one word but the writing around it seems to be pretty puzzling. Kind and of gibberish. So in 1926, Professor Newbold comes up with the idea that, that what? Comes up with the idea that we have an inscription that mentions Christianos that is transliterated Aramaic, and it's written in Latin characters. Aramaic is a Hebrew-like language that Jesus spoke. According to this theory, to understand the inscription, all we have to do is swap the Latin letters for Aramaic ones. When you do that, you know, I can even understand from modern Hebrew, it says a strange mind has overtaken A, doesn't mention who A is, who is now being held as a prisoner among the Christians. Now, that makes a bit of sense to me. If you come with a bunch of guys mm. to a hotel mm. across the street from a brothel, and suddenly one of the guys you were expecting to party with disappears. He's not doing that anymore. He's seen the light, he's born again. You may very well scratch on the wall. He's being held prisoner and missing all the fun. We now have archeological evidence that some of these sex slaves were fighting back with religion. They were converting some of the pagan Romans to the new religion Christianity. We now even almost know one of them by name, by its first initial, A. But if some of these Romans were converting to Christianity, what happened to them? What happened to A? From the texts, we know that wild dogs were let loose on Christians wrapped in animal skins. And amazingly, in nearby Putzwale, we have physical evidence of those early Christians. We have ancient graffiti of a man wrapped in an animal skin. Dating to the first century AD, this is the oldest graffiti of a crucifixion ever found. It caricatures the person crucified by depicting him with a big nose. The crucifixion is depicted from behind, so you can clearly see the cross. It was photographed in 1926, but today, as with so many other graffiti finds, nobody seems to know where it actually is. Following the original archaeological report, which states that the crucifixion was scratched on an ancient tavern wall, Simca and Rebecca set out to find it. It's like one of the earliest crucifixion thing. I thought we could just drive up to it. No, I mean, all the authorities I've been talking to, they know nothing about this thing. So I would suggest, let's try over here. OK. Let's try. Eh, hanno trovato qui, in questa zona, sì. una serie di taberne. Che arriva vicino alla posta. Ok. Oh, perché lui si è there. 
grazie, grazie. 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 Mille, grazie. Mille grazie. Bene, così. È incenta, antiqua. Cosa, antiqua. Romana, antica. Reperto archeologico. Ok. Probabile si vede, c'è anche la tabella là se vede. Ok, perfetto. Sto qua subito a destra. After a few wrong turns, the investigators think they've finally found the network of ancient taverns. These are definitely Roman ruins oh, look, because this is plaster. so huge. Yeah, there are probably taverns all over the place. So you're under some building and you've got yep. a Roman basement. Yeah, what would be interesting is to, if we could go in, walk through that little hallway there and see if that's in fact just one room back there or if it's connected to other space. Right, it looks pretty... Wait. Hey, nothing like trying the door. <laughs> I think we're getting in. Here, follow me. You know, a flashlight is the archaeologist's best friend. Ah, great, here we are. I just happen to have one. It's not open to the public. No, and the rooms just keep going and going. It just keeps going, yeah. Oh my gosh. There's ancient plaster right there. <laughs> this wall with oh. white, this looks like an ancient A because yeah. in ancient graffiti, instead of having a horizontal bar, it's usually diagonal like this. A treasure trove of ancient graffiti, but no sketch of a crucifixion. Simca and Rebecca persevere. After hours of hunting, they find the exact spot where the crucifixion graffiti was originally discovered. But whatever is not etched in stone, is disappearing fast. This is why it's hard to find graffiti, is because plaster is so friable, it easily comes off of walls. And we're incredibly lucky when someone takes a photo and publishes it, because that is probably all we're gonna have 50 years later. Luckily, the photograph survives. Evidence that prior to the eruption of Vesuvius, hundreds, perhaps thousands of Romans, people like A, paid with their lives for their Christian faith. And yet, pagan Rome was not succeeding in wiping out the new religion. In fact, there's archaeological evidence that worshippers of the God of Israel were warning their Roman masters that they were marked for utter destruction. When it comes to ancient artifacts, people like big things, villas, pillars, temples. They ignore little things, like graffiti. But as we've seen, graffiti can tell you a lot. In Pompeii, graffiti tells us that there were Jews and Christians right here before the eruption. Not only that, graffiti shows us that some of these Christians were converting their Roman masters to their newfound religion. In fact, these new converts were paying a heavy price for what they now believed. We saw the earliest image of a crucifixion found anywhere. And we have archaeological evidence that the Jews and Christians of Pompeii were warning their Roman masters, were warning their pagan neighbors that they would soon suffer the wrath of the God of Israel. In 1921, a photograph was published of graffiti scratched on wall plaster. Attached to the published photograph were directions to a specific Pompeii address, House 14. It should be here. You see how the plaster is gone. Yeah. But luckily, we have a really good photo. We have two words, one in Greek, one seemingly in Latin, and then two stars. What do you make of this? Well, start with the middle word. So that's an attempt in Latin letters to represent the word carom, which is one of the most chilling words in the Hebrew language. That's the word used in the Bible when God utterly blots out a place. Sodom and Gomorrah were made Carum. And then you've got the poinium, which is not a, a Latin word, but it's a Latinized word. I think it has to be from the Greek, poine, which means to smite. So smite, utterly destroy, and then the two stars. They're five-pointed, they're the Solomon stars. Uh, we see them on magic bowls. What it shows us is that people in this culture, particularly Jews and Christians, were warning their friends and neighbors and saying, just wait. You think you're in the lap of luxury, you think everything's fine, everything's peaceful, just wait, because God has something to say. In an effort to identify the context in which the harem graffiti was found, Simka and Professor Tabor go to an on-site storage facility. This is the office, come. They want to identify the house where the graffiti was found. Suddenly, to their surprise, a worker brings out the original harem inscription. 
Grazie. The plaster was taken off a wall some 50 years ago. And until now, everyone's only had the photograph. Finally, here is the original. They said it doesn't exist anymore. Never thought I would see it. So here's Scheren, it couldn't be any clearer. And there's Ponium, it's so clear. And there are the two Solomonic stars. What's the significance of finding it in Pompeii? I knew it was in a house, but whose house? And what else do we know about this person? And that's the most important thing with archaeology is to interpret the uh, graffiti, but also where was it found? The context. Yeah, the context. So that it tells more of a story than just the words. Just then, Francesco, one of the workers who was around during the discovery of this graffiti, comes out. If you can explain where this was found. This is not what had been published. House 14 is wrong. The house of Paco Procolo was found with a painting of the owner and his wife on the wall. Simca can see that Francesco sent him to the right place. It's clear where the plaster came from, right in the doorway. It seems that the Stars of Solomon are a kind of amulet designed to protect the family from the harem or destruction that they felt was coming. People put all their pagan stuff right in the doorways to kind of protect the house. It makes sense that a Christian, a Jew, who rejected paganism would put his inscriptions also in the vestibule. Do we know anything about this man? He is, you know, the proprietor of some panifici here in Pompeii. During a trip to Jerusalem, he was converted practically to the Christian religion. How do we know that he converted to Christianity? He has made to him signs allusive. We have testimonials. He has made me see the signs allusive that were on his forms. The phallus. The phallus. The big phallus. He covered. Yes. It's a sign of piety. Whoever owned this bakery, this used to be a bakery, used to have these penises, phalluses, for a good luck charm. But then, here's the key. See the two tones over there? The two tones tell you something. It tells you that it was plastered over. It means that whoever held by that lucky charm suddenly didn't want it there. He converted to Christianity. Francesco shows Simco one final astonishing piece of evidence. The same bakery owner who wrote biblical words on his doorway and had phalluses covered over put a cross in one of his bakeries. They found also a cross in a bakery. Wait, 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 wait. It looks exactly like the one in Herculaneum. The significance of this cross here, it's graffiti. And it's graffiti that looks almost exactly in terms of the plaster, like the cross that was found in Herculaneum. Where was it found? It was found over the oven. This settles the issue of Herculaneum because they weren't keeping books up there on a shelf. It must have been a religious symbol. The cluster of clues pointing to an early Christian movement in Pompeii is incredible. A cross found in a bakery, a baker who covers phallic symbols, and the same baker who in his own home has a graffiti of the Hebrew word marked for utter destruction. It seems that he was trying to protect his family from what he believed was imminent destruction. That destruction was not long in coming. In 79 AD, just nine years after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, ash began to rain down on Pompeii. Right where we're standing now, we would have been inside the volcano, inside the nozzle of a giant rocket engine that's firing its uh, thrust straight up into space, basically 10,000 tons of rock that are going up into the atmosphere per second. It flows like a giant red hot tsunami over the land. And the cloud itself is hot enough to radiate enough heat to ignite the trees that are pinwheeling toward people. If you saw this thing coming, you would try to get away, but you, you just did not have a chance. To experience the devastation from the perspective of a Pompeian family, Charles Pellegrino takes Simca from the mouth of the volcano to a middle-class home on the edge of the city. So, Charlie, what's the significance of this place? 
some of the Roman letters and writings that have survived, specifically Pliny the Younger, who was 17 years old at the time, he gives us the time of the start of the eruption, around lunchtime. And what we're seeing here is the relatively gentle eruption. You have uh, people who are able to climb up on top of the pumice, hoping that whatever is going on, it is going to slow down, it's going to stop. It's almost like people at a flood. You keep trying to go higher, right. and then you hope it stops, and then you're gonna drain. Right, and right on top of this very sequence higher up, we find the people themselves. Okay, now let's follow in the footsteps of the family. Okay. Take us right up. Perhaps the people are able to make some kind of rudimentary shelter, which is suggested by the wood that we see here. Herculaneum dies between 12 and 1 a.m. The first surge cloud goes right through Herculaneum, hotter than steel emerging white hot from a furnace. And within about a three second period, every person, every animal, every plant, the termites and even the bacteria are instantly carbonized. Over here in Pompeii, life still goes on for a while. But at about 7.30 a.m., Right the here? fourth surge cloud. This is right here? Right here, literally megatons of it, and it surges across the ground like a tsunami made out of ash. And here the people would have died in a time frame within two seconds, possibly less than one second. These are the people who were able to climb up on top of it. Here you can even see one figure that's putting an arm over another figure. There are skeletons inside every one of these casts. Now, this is very, very sad, because it looks like somebody's sheltering, maybe a, a child and a parent. Well, what we have here, we won't know until we x-ray this one. Oh, my god. But it could be bloating, or it could be a man trying to oh shelter my. from the ash, getting into the mouth of someone who was pregnant. The minute you said that, I suddenly realized yeah. we're looking at a pregnant woman, and her husband is trying to shelter her. Yeah, and it speaks for us all, you know, that in a moment like this, you have this moment of mutual human tenderness that might be a different civilization, but these people are us. A few weeks after the eruption, that may have killed as many as 20,000 people, an overwhelming number by ancient standards. Pompeii was a cold corpse of a city. People had died where they were. Thousands of bodies lay in their homes and out in the streets. The whole city was buried in small pumice stones and ash, up to the top floors. But there is evidence that after the eruption, Romans from other towns tunneled down to floor level, crawling on their hands and knees, coming face to face with the destruction. The tunnelers recorded their interpretation of the events as the wrath of God. Post Fata Novissima, after the most recent Fata, the sun strengthens these pleasing to God people against the cold people almost like a biblical reference, that this is punishment, divine wrath. There are those people, and this is a very biblical terminology, who are pleasing to God, and there are those people, the pagans, who are not pleasing to God, and they're dead, they're frozen. You can literally see the wrath of God. Strikingly, the eruption of Vesuvius parallels a much earlier story that Jews and Christians knew all too well, Sodom and Gomorrah sister cities whose inhabitants were notorious for their sexual deviations. The book of Genesis records that as punishment for their sins, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire and brimstone. Incredibly, there's a graffiti that directly links Pompeii to Sodom and Gomorrah. Today been made into a kind of modern guardhouse, but in the first century, this was somebody's home and maybe the day of the eruption, or even the day before the volcanic eruption, somebody hastily scrawled on the wall in charcoal the chilling words, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, somebody literally is writing this while the ash is falling down. Possibly, yeah. It's not there anymore. 
It was on one of these walls that's now modern plaster. Yeah. And it's been taken off to some museum. What do you make of this charcoal inscription showing up here? This has to be a Jew or a Christian who's thinking, why is the volcano erupting? Because this is Sodom and Gomorrah, and God is punishing this place. It's amazing. Aren't we imposing our view how they would have interpreted it? What do we have that says, you know what, now we know that Christians and Romans interpreted the eruption of Vesuvius as the divine wrath of God. In the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, if you read that, it has to be a description of the destruction of Pompeii. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're telling me that... Pompeii is mentioned in the New Testament, not by name. What the text says is Babylon is gonna fall. Babylon means Rome. So it's everything from the city of Rome, the culture of Rome. But the date of that text is from the time of the Emperor Titus. And it's around the year 79, this text is written. And it talks about the city will be destroyed in one hour. The smoke of its burning will be seen in the harbor and mentions fornication and immorality. Allegorically, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. What you're suggesting is that hiding in plain sight in the New Testament itself, the interpretation was that this is divine retribution. They saw the burning of Pompeii as the beginning of the end, as Rome is headed down. How do we know? Because God burned it in a single day like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what happened right where we're standing. I can just imagine a slave from the Holy Land cringing in a corner. There's nowhere to run, and ash is raining down. He or she, someone like Martha, would have seen the glory of the temple in Jerusalem and its destruction. Then in Pompeii as a slave, they would have witnessed and maybe even experienced violence and orgies. Now, as Vesuvian ash was coming down, I can imagine Martha dipping into it and writing the epitaph of Pompeii, Sodom and Gomorrah. Less than two years after the eruption, the Emperor Titus died. A few Romans converted to Judaism, but a more sizable group converted to the new, more accessible Jewish sect already being called Christianity. It was this group that laid the foundation for the whole empire to become Christian less than 250 years after the eruption. And for Christianity to become, to this day, the most populous religion in the world, and all this was accomplished with a little help from a volcano called Vesuvius.